you all today. Would you come on up, Molly? Um, really good to see you all today. Um, I know it was about three years ago that we came through here last, and uh, it's always a blessing to come here, and um, just a blessing to worship God together. You know, you go around the world, and uh, it's just a blessing to find in each place people that love God, they, they want to serve Him and follow Him, and it's just a blessing to do that on Sabbath morning. So we're really excited to be here, even though it's a little cold outside, colder than we're used to. Um, we come from Cambodia, so we've got soft over the last three years, and uh, so I'm glad that mum brought up some, what, what do you call them mum? Thermals, all right, thermos or whatever. So we have some of them on, so that's keeping us going. But um, it's really good to, to be here. And this morning, we want to take you on a journey, our journey that God has taken us on over the past about two and a half years. And we just want to share with you, uh, really, it's a praise of what God is doing and what God has done. And we've just stood in awe to watch him work through people like us. So before we get started, let's bow our heads for an add a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, what a blessing it is to come here and worship you. Father, you have done so much for us. You've sent your son to die for us, and Father, so that we can have hope and life. And Lord, just now we pray that you would send your sweet Holy Spirit to be here. Lord, we need him more than anything, and we just pray that he'd be here in each one of our hearts, and that he'd lift every burden here, and lift up Jesus, who is the answer to every need that we have, in Jesus' name, amen. About uh, two and a half to three years ago, we uh, accepted the call to leave Michigan, we were pastoring there, and to head to Cambodia to an unreached people group there um, that uh, numbers about a half a million. And these people, uh, called the Cham, are Muslim, and uh, for all practical purposes, totally unreached. And so we felt a burden that we should go there. We could go there and start to work and plant churches there. So we made the long trip from Cambodia, excuse me, from the U.S. to New Zealand and then up to, up to Cambodia. And uh, when we arrived there in Cambodia, we went to Phnom Penh, the capital city, and we spent about 10 months there learning the Khmer or the Khmer language. Now, has anybody here learned a language other than English? Second language, all right. So you know how, of a, how much of a challenge that is. I discovered that I'm not really gifted in learning languages. But anyway, it was something that we needed to do if we wanted to reach these people. So God gave us grace, and we spent 10 months there learning this language to a, a decent level where we could kind of converse. And then we, would, we, we were anxious to get up to these people group, to, to the charm people. And so 10 months into it, we made out, we left uh, Phnom Penh, the capital city, and we made our way up the banks of the Mekong River, and um, a huge river, about a mile across when it floods. And we went through some mud, and we went past some rice paddies, and we came to the bend in the river about four and a half hours north of, northeast of Phnom Penh to a little charm village right on the banks there called Leviathan. And you know, we were, we were praying, Lord, please open up the door to the place where you would have us work because these people are Muslim. And if you know anything about, or if you've heard on the news about, um, about uh, Muslim people, many of them don't like Westerners, right? Many of them don't. So we were praying, say, Lord, we don't know how to do this, but you just open the doors for us. And so we went to the chief's house and we said, Chief, uh, we are here to help your people. We would like to teach you and your children English and also to help with some health. Is that something that you would like help with in this village? And he, uh, he, in essence, opened up his arms and he said, yes, please, come here to our village, teach us and our children English. And so God opened the door wide open for us to minister there amongst this people group. Um, the first night we arrived there, uh, we woke up the next day to a big surprise. And Molly, why don't you share what happened the next day? The next day, we woke up with water all around and under our house. 
And um, this is normal for Cambodia. Every year they have about four weeks of flooding. But we, had, we thought the flooding was over. So anyways, it was kind of a surprise to us. And um, we just happened to all be sick at the same time. And um, the house was a mess because we hadn't unpacked anything yet. Um, all the ants had decided that our house made a great Noah's Ark. And um, the mice did too. Um, there were no screens or anything, so we had lots of mosquitoes and bugs. Um, and we didn't have any plumbing or anything, so Greg would have to slog through this water here to try to find a way to get some water for us to, you know, bathe and wash clothes. We had to wash clothes by hand. And um, it was just really an overwhelming first day and actually first week or two. Um, and I remember it would take two or three hours a day just to try to wash clothes by hand and my knuckles would be bleeding and I was, <clears throat> I was sick and um, I guess I couldn't catch up because like the kids had thrown up on the bedding and um, so I remember one day after washing laundry for three hours after the kids had gone to bed and I just flopped into bed next to to Greg and said, you know, I just don't think I can do this one more day. Like, my energy was totally gone. And um, I just started crying and just said, you know, I just don't think I can do it. And Greg was feeling similar. I mean, he was sick and having to try to do everything. It just took all our time to survive, let alone try to unpack anything. Um, but as we talked and prayed that, that night, um, a just a thought was really impressed on both of our minds. And that thought was that if Satan was that mad that we were there and he was trying to get us to go away and discourage us, that there must be some really precious chum people that God had um, for us to reach. And so that really encouraged us, and we chose to stick it out. And praise the Lord, we're still there, and we, we love it. <laughs> So not only was the water all around the house something different, uh, we discovered, soon discovered that the language was very different. These people speak, they speak Cambodian, but they also speak their own language to, to each other in, in their religious services. So their language was very different. Their conversation was very different, what they talked about. Uh, their dress, of course, was very different. Their food was different. Their occupations were very different than what we were used to. And, of course, their religion was very different, just to name a few things. Not only were they different to us, but we were really different to them. When you're the only white person in a village, you kind of uh, stick out like a sore thumb. So um, they wanted to know all about us. They, wanted, they were always asking us lots of questions like, well, what do you eat? And... How many times a day do you eat? They asked us, um, do you pray? Do you, uh, how many times a day do you pray? Um, is it boring here or do you like it better in America or New Zealand? They asked us if, <laughs> they, they always were asking me if I was pregnant because they have really huge families. Um, you know, seven to 14 kids is really normal. So they, they're always asking me, why aren't you pregnant? <laughs> you know, so they asked very different kinds of questions than we would talk to each other. Um, they even asked things like, well, what do you wear to bed? And, well, you dress like this here, but what do you wear in America? Um, they wanted to see if we were really genuine or who, who we seemed to be. Um, after a while, we felt like we were living in a fishbowl. So when we arrived there, many of the people welcomed us with open arms. Little did we know that um, some were adamant that we should not be there in the village. And um, so with all of these differences and all of these um, suspicions, how in the world can you even hope to bridge this gap and come close to these people in a way that they can relate to? And uh, so we, we wrestled with this. And, you know, we don't have doctorates in reaching Muslims or we don't have any slick formulas on how to do that. But early, early on, God impressed us with, with this one principle. And it's found in Ministry of Healing. And I'm sure you know it well. It says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. 
the Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good, and he showed his sympathy to them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. So we determined right from the beginning that if it killed us, we would mingle, all right? And we would do whatever it took. And so we would go to these people's homes. We would sit there on their floors and eat the food that we could with them. And uh, we would speak with them and, and love them and, and, and just try and show them that we wanted to be there. Out of respect for their culture, Molly started to wear the head covering. And uh, they know that we don't wear that. She doesn't wear it in America. Um, but they knew that she chose to wear it as, out of respect for their views of modesty. And um, you should have heard the chief when he first saw her dressed like that. He looked at her and he said, oh, he said, Sa'at, Sa'at, nah, which means beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> and so we knew that, you know, by God's grace, we'd scored some brownie points with the chief. <laughs> um, so we continued to, to visit with them and we started to attend their celebrations that they had invited us to. And after several months, I even took the plunge um, and this was the most dramatic thing that I have done there in Cambodia. But I took the plunge and I wrapped on the skirt that the men wear. <laughs> and it was really traumatic. I mean, you know, guys, we're not used to wearing skirts, most of us. So I, I wrapped this on and uh, I came out of the bedroom and uh, the kids looked at me and they said, Daddy's got a skirt on, Daddy's got a skirt on. So that didn't help anything. But I went across to, the reason why I put it on was to attend a celebration. So I walked across the street, the road to the house. And when the men saw me, they, they laughed and they smiled. And then they said something I'd never forget. They said, you are just like us. And I thought to myself, praise the Lord that they can see that we are trying to, to come close to them. Um, the reason why we're there in the village, quote unquote, because you can't go into a Muslim village being a missionary, right? No. So the reason why we're there is to teach English and also to help them with basic health. So I teach an English class uh, Monday through Thursday, one hour a day, and we help them with basic health where we can. We either patch up their wounds ourselves or we connect them to, to the organizations that can. We've had some medical teams come from America We've had an ophthalmologist come. Um, we've had a general practitioner come. We've had dentists come. All of this to help them with their, with their physical needs. We also took a lot of effort to convey that we're spiritual people. Um, we told them that we believe in God like they do. We told them that we are praying people. And we shared with them that we follow God's books, the Tarat, the Zabur, and the Injil. And those books are the books of Moses, the um, Psalms, and the Gospels. And they actually believe in these books as well, but they've never read them or heard them, um, but they consider them to be holy books, um, as well as the Quran, of course. Um, we also shared with them that we don't eat pork, which is a really big thing in their religion, um, and that we don't drink alcohol. And so um, they, they saw that we had a lot of connections. Um, and praise God, after several months, God took our stumbling words and our awkward actions and made the people know that we really did love them and that we really could be trusted. And they begin to feel that we really did believe in God, um, like we said. And I remember one Friday, I came to visit at the house of these ladies here. These are some of our best friends in the village. Um, on Fridays, usually the men go to the mosque, but the ladies don't go to the mosque to worship. They, um, they'll gather in one of the houses and they have a lady religious teacher that comes and teaches them and then they'll do their um, formal prayers together. Um, so this day when I came to visit, they had just finished their meeting and um, Mayjeep sitting there on the back had some more questions for the religious teacher. So she brought out a book. It had Arabic writing and also it had um, uh, Cham writing and she started asking questions 
about, and I understood some of it, she was talking about Christians and the Gospels, and pretty soon they started a heated discussion back and forth. And um, soon they turned to me, and they said, um, do you follow Jesus? And I assured them, yes, yes, I follow Jesus. And do you follow the Gospels? Yes, I assured them I did. And the religious teacher got this triumphant look on her face and said, um, see, I told you she's just the same as all those other Christians, those other Christians that are in town. And our friends here said, no, no, she, they're, they're not the same. They're different. Um, they, study, they study the holy books a lot more, and they understand a lot more about the holy books. And um, so then they turned to me again and asked, well, do you eat pork? Do you drink alcohol? And I assured them, no, we don't because God has, you know, asked us to keep our bodies healthy. And, um, and then the, the religious teacher got this confused look on her face, and she said, but the people in town say they follow Jesus and they follow the Gospels, but they eat pork and they drink alcohol. But you both say you follow Jesus. I don't understand. And so um, I had an opportunity to share um, kind of the differences, you know, that there are different denominations. They don't understand. They think there's all just one big Christian. All the Christians are one big thing. So I shared with them that um, some Christians follow only parts of God's books but that we really strive to follow all of God's writings. And so um, our other friends here said, see, we told you they were different. You know, Seventh-day Adventists are in a key position to reach Muslims. I don't know if you know that, but uh, we have many, many uh, common areas, common points, and uh, we can really uh, zero in on these and really win, win a lot of um, respect to help us from there, reach, reach them. Um, just another quick story about what helped us gain credibility in the village. The chief was very sick. He told me one day, he said, listen, I'm afraid I'm going to die. And I said, oh, really? He said, yep. Yeah. He looked kind of sick. And I said, what's up? He said, he said, I can't eat. I, I, I feel sick. You know, I have hepatitis B. And Molly and I, we're not medical people, but we do have some books, right? So we went home, took our medical books off the shelf, looked up hepatitis B. We went back to him and we said, Chief, listen, you need to take this charcoal internally. You need to get off your smoking, your drinking. Uh, he's, he doesn't drink, tea. at least in the village. Tea drinking. Uh, quit drinking tea. Uh, we put him on a plain diet and we prayed. We said, Lord, please bless this man and please raise him back to health and strength. We also did some hydrotherapy treatments on him. And within two to three weeks, his symptoms were totally gone, and he was completely symptom-free. And God had worked a miracle. And he came over to our house, and he said, thank you, and thank God that I am now well. God has used you to, to help me get well. So we just praise, praise God for that. Um, thanks, hon. So God, in all of these ways, has shown us that if we just let him, he really wants to work on behalf of people, to reach people for the kingdom. I would invite you just to turn in your Bibles now to John chapter 6, which was our scripture reading. John chapter 6 and verse 5. John chapter 6 and verse 5. And I want to take you in your mind's eye back 2,000 years ago to a hillside where there's a great multitude and Jesus is sitting there. John chapter 6, verse 5. It says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these people may eat? As I was reading over the story, I was, I was convicted that this story is really our story. Because there you've got, in front of Jesus, you've got a great multitude in need. And friends, I believe that in front of us, there's a world out there who is in need. Amen? Amen? I want to ask you a question. How many people live, inhabit this globe today? Approximately how many people in this world? 6.5 billion, approximately. Okay, 6.5 billion. Now, somebody told me to count up to a billion, or to count up to 6 billion, it would take 200 years, something like that. You can do the math. 
but it's a lot of people. How many people have never heard the name of Jesus or never heard the gospel? Anybody want to take a guess? About 1.5 to 2 billion people have never heard the name of Jesus or the gospel. Now, how many Muslims are there in the world? Anybody? Normally these figures aren't numbers that we kind of crunch around from day to day, but 1.465 billion people, a billion Muslims in the world today, 1.465 billion people. So if you think about those numbers, about one in every four or five is a Muslim that's inhabiting this globe right now. Now talk about a great need, a huge need there in front of us. And Jesus and Philip had a great need back in his day. Now verse 6 says, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus asks Philip a question. And he says, Philip, how are we going to feed this multitude? Now I want you to think about this for a second. Did Jesus know how this multitude would be fed? Yes, so why did he ask the question? You know, if you look in Scripture, God asks lots of questions that he already knows the answers to, right? Remember when he was walking through the Garden of Eden and he said, Adam, where are you? Did he know where Adam was? You you better believe he knew where Adam was. So why did he ask the question? I believe the reason why he asked Philip the question was because he wanted Philip to think, to start to mull this over in his mind. He wanted Philip to think, how in the world will we feed this multitude of people? How will we supply this need that's in front of us? I believe God wants us to think and wrestle with that too. God wants us to wrestle with this great need that we have, this unreached world that's in front of us. How are we going to reach this world for Christ before Jesus comes again? But it said there in verse 6 that Jesus said this to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Praise God, Jesus knows how he's going to reach this world. He's got it figured out already, but he wants us to be involved in it. Amen? All right, now verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. So when Jesus asked this question, Philip did the natural thing that all of us do. He started to take out his wallet. And he started to see how much money he had. He looked in his pockets, and that was, that was a kind of a hopeless cause. He basically went through all the resources that he had that were available to him. And he came to the conclusion that he didn't have what it was going to take to feed this multitude. All right? And friends, I believe that we need to come to that same point too. We need to come to the point where we realize that, you know what, if something good is going to happen, if we're going to reach souls for God... God's going to have to do it for us and through us. Amen? It's a natural human tendency for us to try and do in our own strength what God asks us to do. But God wants us to to come to the end of ourselves and say, God, if anything's going to happen here, you are going to have to do it. And God needs to come to us here in Wangarei, and we need to come to the point where we say, God, if anything's going to happen here, you're going to have to do it. Be involved in it. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we need to trust God more than we trust ourselves. That's a hard lesson for us, at least for me, to learn. We need to trust God. But God has it figured out if we will just seek him and follow him. Verse 8 says, One of his disciples, Andrew Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? In verse 10, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down, Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, a number about 5,000. Now, that's just men, so it was probably maybe 15,000 with women and children. Who knows? And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. We know the rest of the story. Andrew, Jesus' disciple, finds this little boy's lunch, gives it to Jesus, and Jesus feeds a multitude. What's the lesson here? It's pretty self-explanatory. That Jesus didn't need a warehouse full of food to supply this need. But what Jesus did need, what he was looking for, was something that was consecrated to him, that was laid on the altar, and then Jesus could use that. You know, I believe that 
numbers really don't mean much to God. I mean, God's interested in numbers, don't get me wrong. He wants as many people saved as possible. So numbers are important. But God has never needed numbers to accomplish the work that he wants done. Do you remember the story of Gideon? 32,000 soldiers were too many for God to work through. And why was that? Because they, most of them were unconsecrated. Most of them weren't trusting in God. And they hadn't committed themselves to him and weren't trusting him and following him. So they wheedled that down to 10,000. And there was still too many people for God to use. Until they came down to 300. And then God had who he could use. Now, God can use 32,000 too. Amen? And he can use 32,000 people more than he could use 300 if they're consecrated to him. But the most important thing is, God is looking for resources and people that are committed to him and that are trusting him by faith. Amen? And that are throwing themselves into his work. Just um, about three months ago, my wife and I went to America. And while there, we went to a camp meeting and Mark Finley was there. Everybody know Mark Finley? Seen him? And uh, Mark Finley spoke on the last Sabbath and he told a story about when he went to Brazil. And he went to Brazil there and he asked the people, the administrators, he said, who is your biggest soul winner in this union? And they said, oh, that's easy, so-and-so. He won 1,200 people last year for Jesus. And Mark Finley got to think and thought, well, that's pretty good, 1,200 people, you know, one layman. And so uh, Mark Finley said, I want to meet this guy. Can you introduce me to him? And, you know, they said, no problem. When they were taking Mark to meet him, you know, Mark had, was envisioning this big evangelist, you know, with a booming voice, broad shoulders and whatnot. Well, they ushered Mark into the room, and he kind of looked around, couldn't see anybody. Then he lowered his gaze, and then he saw a little midget standing in front of him. And they said, well, this is our greatest soul winner here in this union. And uh, so Mark got down. I don't know if he got down on one knee, but he looked down, and he said, so tell me, what did you do? What was the secret? Did you hold an evangelistic series? Did you have all of these small groups? What did you do? He said, no. He said, all I did was this. He said, I went like this, then I went like this, and then I go like this. He said, what? He said, well, all I do is I go like this, and then I go like this, and then I go like this. Well, by this time, you know, Mark, Pastor Finley's totally bamboozled, and he said, well, break this down to me, tell me. He said, well, what we do is we've discovered that the first step in reaching people is to smile at them and to be friends. So I go like this. And he said, then we invite these people back to our home. Uh, we, we, we open our home Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. And we give them a meal. And we, and we talk. And he said, after we do that, he said, he said, I take your video, and I go like this. And then he said, I push play, and I go like this. And he says, God has blessed our efforts with 1,200 souls. Amen? To me, that's just exciting because that tells you that all God needs is our loaves and fishes, and he will bless. Amen. Now, I know some areas are harder than, than, than Brazil, all right? But the principle is the same, that God wants to use every single one of us. Why do I share that story? I share that because we have seen this firsthand in the work that we do. You know, most of the time, Molly and I feel like four-year-olds in our village, we stumble through the language, and, you know, we will ask, um, you know, somebody will ask for a hammer, and we'll tell them we'll go get a smile, okay, because the same, a very similar word. Um, we just put our foot in our mouths all the time. And uh, we, every day we wake up and we say, God, how in the world can you use us to reach half a million people, all right? And, but we've seen over and over again that God can use us if we're just willing. Um, I want to share a story now about, um, can we get the thing back on the screen? About a man, a friend of ours. His name's Yah. You know, if you know anything about Southeast Asia, you know there's lots of snakes, lots of deadly snakes. They have some snakes like the elephant snake. One bite can drop an elephant, all right, kill it. They have snakes that if they bite into you... It, 
their venom starts to um, eat away at your flesh. They have other snakes that bite you, and when the venom travels around the bloodstream, it starts, it's a hemotoxin, you start to spontaneously bleed. All right? So many people die every year through snake bites. Well, our friend Yah was up at his mountain garden, and uh, it was dark, and he had made his way from the little shack that he stays at up there in the, up there in the, in the garden down to the river to get some water. And he went down there, and as he was approaching the river, he felt an intense pain on the top of his foot. And he let out a yell, and it was so painful that he actually fell into the river. And fortunately, his wife was up there at the shack. She came down, picked him up, and took him back to the, to the shack, put him on an ox cart, and they made the long way back to their village on the banks of the Mekong River. Well, in the morning, they looked at his foot, and sure enough, there were two fang marks right on the top of his foot, and the uh, toxin was starting to eat away at the flesh. Soon it became badly infected. So they knew they had to get to the provincial capital. They went to the capital, and the doctor looked there at the foot, and he said, yeah, he said, sorry, we're going to have to cut it off at the ankle, amputate. And yeah said, thanks, but no thanks. Went back to his village house. This time he went up the other direction, up the river the other direction, looking for somebody to help him. He tried the witch doctors. He tried the, he tried the um, uh, other doctors. And this is my friend, Yah. It's no avail. So he went back to his house, hoping that somehow his foot would heal. Well, somebody came to us, and they said, can you come and help? We said, well, we'll come and take a look. So we went to Yah's house. I went to Yah's house, climbed up the ladder, sat on his floor, and this is what I saw. Snake had bitten the top. And actually what I saw was a lot worse than this. You can see the pink skin. Has, that's the new skin. Um, when I saw it, it was back to the brown skin. And it was infected. It was pussy. And um, so I looked at that. You know, I'm not a doctor, but in these situations, you have to at least act confident, right? Like you know what you're doing. So I swallowed hard, and I said, okay, I think we can do something here. Got some gauze, cleaned it out, packed it, covered it, and I gave him some antibiotics, and I said, yeah, can I pray? You know, Muslims believe in prayer. They really do. And they put me to shame. Many times I see these beautiful people, you know, five times a day, praying the best they know how. And I think to myself, boy, if only I could carve out enough time to spend that much time in prayer. So these people are praying people, and they believe in Jesus too. They believe that Jesus is a prophet, and they believe that he's a healing prophet, but they don't believe that he's God. But there's many, many things that they believe that are similar to ours. Anyway, so I got on my knees. I said, Lord, please, if it's your will, please heal Yah. And God started to work a miracle over the next few weeks God started to heal his foot. The flesh began to fill in. The skin began to grow back. And it grew back all the way to the edge of the bone. And then the top of the bone began to separate from the other, from the rest of the bone. Um, and so I got a little bit worried. I said, yeah, we need to send you to Phnom Penh. We sent him to a Christian clinic. Little did I know that God was not only working a miracle on his flesh, God was starting to work a miracle in his heart. Because while there, somebody gave him a book about the Bible. And yeah, I remember he's a devout Muslim, began to read and study. And when he came back to the village, he said, Greg, he lowered his voice because he didn't want everybody to hear. He said, Greg, he said, somebody gave me this book and it's about the Bible and it's about Jesus, Isa, and it's good, really, really good. Well, we continued to pray and the skin continued to cover, covered the bone, and it just had two little, little holes on either side of the bone. But Yah, in his anxious, in his eagerness to get back to work, went out to, to plow the field, and it got infected. He didn't cover it up. It got infected again. So we said, Yah, you've got to go back to the hospital, this time the close one. We took him back, went there for a week, gave him antibiotics. And then on the way home, he told me something I'd never, ever forget. I will never forget. He looked at me and his face was glowing and he said, sorry, I'll spare you that. He said to me, he said, last night I saw God. 
I said, what? Who did you see? He said, I saw God. What would be your next question? Well, this is my question. I said, so what did he look like? And he said, oh, he said, he was beautiful. He was shining. He, had, he was, the top part of his body was all white and shining. And the bottom part was all white and shining as well. Then I said, well, what did he say to you? And he said to me, he said, he said, yeah, you will get well. And he and I forgot to mention this. I'd given him a New Testament Bible about a week before, okay? And he said, yeah, he said, you need to study that book. You need to study that Bible that you were given. Well, yeah, I was, yeah, I was just glowing, you know. And uh, this happened just about three weeks before we left for furlough. But just before we left for furlough, I asked, yeah. I said, yeah, so who did you see that night? Was it God, and I was meaning God the Father, Allah, which is the Arabic word for God, or was it Isa, Jesus? And he said, he said, I saw Isa, I saw Jesus, and Jesus came and told me that I needed to study the Bible. Well, Yah uh, cannot read that well, so I gave him the Bible on MP3 player for him to listen to. And before I left, I asked him, Yah, have you started to listen to it? And he said, Yeah. And he said, it's good. It's really, really good. Why do I share that? The reason why I share that is because Molly and I can speak charm, but we still are like four-year-olds in our ability to, to communicate. But what struck me about that story was even when we can't communicate, if we just put our loaves and fishes on the altar, God will take that and communicate in spite of us. And so even though Molly and I can't speak charm fluently yet, I know someone who can, and that's Jesus. And he came and spoke fluently to Yah in his own language and said, you'll get well, you need to study the Bible. Praise God, eh? Amen. Praise God. That's what God wants to do, I believe, through each one of us. And he will, and he is, if we every day commit our lives to him and trust him. You know, too many times we trust ourselves, I think, and what we can do. We need to trust more in what God can do Believe more in what God can do and trust Him. And then step out in faith and God will bless. Just in closing here, we wanted to share some pictures of our people so you get more of an idea of what they look like. And we wanted to play a little song. So just bear with me here as I get this up and running. Um, Molly, could you come up and hold it? Just take this one.
to know them um, just to give you just in closing here we uh, God has provided for us another family who are going to help us um, with a clinic a health clinic and um, so that's a blessing and so we just ask that you'd pray for our people pray for the charm people if you want to come over and help us sometime just get in contact with us we'd love to have you come and help us um, just the other day the chief came to us and he said, you know, he said, before you came here, some people wanted you here and some people didn't. And he said, now, he said, everybody wants you here. And we just, we know that won't always be the case. You know, when you start to share further from the Bible, you know, there's going to be some resistance, but um, at least at this point. And we, all we can say is praise God that he's taken us and, to, and, and using us to help reach hearts. Why don't we um, uh, sing our closing hymn, I think. Hymn number 371, is it? Lift him up. Um, because this is what it's all about, lifting Jesus up. And the Bible says that when we do that, he'll draw all men to himself. So let's sing hymn number 371, Lift Him Up. It's on the screen. Let's all stand, shall we? Lift him up, says he that bid you. Let the dying look and live. To a weary, thirsting sinners, living waters will he give. Learn so meek and lowly, yet the prince of heaven was he. And the blind who grope in darkness Through the blood of Christ shall see Lift him up, the risen Savior High amid the waiting throng Lift him up, to see that speaketh Now he bids you flee from wrong Lift him up Precious Savior, let the multitude behold. May repent and turn and live forever. We will draw them hastening on with joyous feet. They shall bear the cross of Jesus and shall find salvation sweet. Lift him up, the risen Savior, high amid the waiting throng. Lift him up to see that speaketh, now he bids you flee from wrong. Lift him up in all his glory, tis the Son of God on high. Lift him up, his love shall draw. And from tongue to tongue repeat it, mighty throng shall bless his name. Lift him up, the risen Savior, I am in the waiting throng. Lift him up, tis he that speaketh, now he bids you flee from wrong. Oh, then lift him up.
Let's pray. Oh, Father, that's all that's important in this life is to lift Jesus up. Father, you know of the tremendous need in the world today. Father, a need that's not only overseas in places like Cambodia, but a tremendous need here in New Zealand, in Wangarei, in Dargaville, wherever we are from. Father, there's a tremendous need. And the answer to that need is Jesus, only Jesus. So we ask, Father, that we would be part of, that we would take part in lifting him up as the only hope of this world for a dying world. But Father, first of all, may we have him lifted up in our own hearts so that we can have something to share. That's our prayer, Lord. That's our earnest prayer in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.